studies which you made into the Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga practices of India, Madame Blavatsky set in motion the controversy uh, which I suspect was a subject rather richly deserved. She points out clearly that the greater part of our general study in these yogas is a waste of time. And the points which she makes, I, I think we should consider it more or less sequentially. And add perhaps just a few observations from more recent researches and experiences. She points out, for example, that the esoteric teachings of India and the other countries under Indian philosophic influence, these teachings are rather inconsistent. There are great many schools, many different yogins have almost conflicting systems. And this condition has existed from a very early time. And to this, I think we have to add that in the last hundred years, certainly, uh, the Easterners themselves have become just about as much confused as the Western truth seeker trying to understand them. Uh, it's a mistake which we all have to get over in time to assume that these older civilizations are faithfully practicing their ancient belief here and unadulterated. This is not the case. The average Hindu of today is not much better informed on his religion than the average Christian is on esoteric Christianity. Most people are followers, believers, members, and acceptors. A great many Orthodox Orientals do not believe that there is such a thing as an esoteric tradition. They are just as disillusioned on this problem as the Westerner would be disillusioned on some of the idealistic mysticisms of the Middle Ages. So we cannot simply assume that by going to one of these countries and staying there even for several years, that we are going to come into the presence of this great knowledge. One thing I believe we will find, however, that is worthy of consideration. We will find a greater respect for idealism than in most Western countries. We also will find that the old practices that at one time or another dominated the life of the people still survive as living forces in their daily experiences. There are still teachers following the old ways of doing things. We can drop back 2,500 years easily in one of the remote villages and mountain towns of North India. We can live almost as things were at the time when some of these great systems were being developed. We will find there also old and venerable priests, monks, yogins, who are without question completely sincere persons. But we will really always run against one of two negative situations. Either these men do not know or they will not talk. And we have one or the other. And one is just about as bad a stalemate as the other. Now, if we face people as they really are, not many venerable Asians are willing to admit they do not know. Therefore, they are much more inclined to do exactly what Westerners do under the same situations. Witness to us and explain that that will be told in a more advanced degree. And of course, no one lives long enough to get that far advanced. Each time, the essential knowledge is still in the future. 
Any means at all, I think that the real problem lies in the fact that these venerable persons are sincere. But they in turn are trusting upon another situation uh, which has descended to them traditionally. And this is one which uh, no one can cope with too well. Uh, they assume that they represent the junior grades of a system. And that when their students reach a point where they have outgrown the primary instruction, they should be and will be passed on to higher instructors. Therefore, the ordinary holy man simply attempts to indoctrinate his chola or his disciple with holiness, with piety, with devotion, and tries to perfect in him or advance in him the moral virtues. When the your disciple has apparently attained these things, then the old teacher is apt to say, My son, I have done all I can for you. Now go forth and find a higher teacher. And this is not considered to be an evasion of the fact. Uh, the uh, uh, yogin is quite convinced that these higher teachers do exist. And the young disciple goes forth to attach himself to someone whose reputation or traditional standing entitled them to special recognition. The gateway to this whole system is to be found in the outskirts of nearly every small town in India, somewhere in the vicinity, not usually in the bustling part, except perhaps in a few of the major cities. Usually in a quiet suburb or in a mountain retreat nearby, there is a traditionally sanctified home. He has been there for a long time, and this time increases in the natural imagination of the people. Perhaps several generations of all the subjects have lived in one of, this, uh, one of these hermitage areas. In the course of time, they have been tied together as one person. And the natives will very solemnly say that this old holy man has been there for 300 years. They believe it. Or perhaps he's been there for 30 or 40 years, and the rest is sort of an accumulation based on veneration. But in any respect, there is some such a person. A young and uh, naturally devout person, young man, usually goes to one of these holy men and receives the basic insight into this long and difficult path that leads finally uh, to the esoteric uh, doctrines of the people. India has this advantage that it affirms the reality of these esoteric teachings. And as this affirmation survived over a hundred years of British occupation, in which everything possible was done to discourage it, might imply that it's pretty deep rooted. So it is simply and naturally assumed that there are different kinds of lives that you can live. You can be the householder, the businessman, the professional man, or you can leave your illness and seek for sanctity, wandering around Asia among those four million Hindus who are dedicated to the religious life and who travel from place to place without any fixed benefit. These men are venerated, they're respected. They are held to be living a pious and worthwhile life. And uh, in fairness to them, let us say that they are useful people. Perhaps more useful in the past than they will be in the future. They are useful because they carry down so large a part of the communication system of Asia. They also carry down a great part of the judicial responsibilities that involve villages. For the men were the lawyers and the doctors and the arbiters of dispute. Uh, they were the ones who read letters for persons who were illiterate and wrote letters for others who were illiterate. Uh, they uh, were counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists. They were priests, and they also frequently stepped in and did the work of the house 
is rather wandering existences. Here today, gone tomorrow. But if they were gone in a few days later, you would hear the iron-bound staff of another holy man striking up on the hard path road. And very soon, another of these spiritual wanderers would come into your vicinity. All of this was part of an acceptance. This acceptance, however, they are loaded with implications, has always been a very difficult acceptance to clarify, to get at in the terms of what do these persons actually know? What do they really believe? What degree of metaphysical power or insight do they actually possess? And of course, the moment you get into this region, you get into an area where you have to depend on us entirely upon acceptances. The answers are not going to be immediately forthcoming, perhaps never in your lifetime. You either believe or you do not believe. Either you move into this peculiar atmosphere that has existed for ages, or else you resist it and deny its reality. And the third would it's all, or other strange and somewhat uh, mysterious uh, situation. We have the same problem here among our Southwest Indians. There is no question, as Lewis pointed out, that these Indians perform miracles. There seems to be no question that they can draw rain. Also, that they are able to cheat in some way we know nothing about the bites of dangerous snakes. That they are able to perform the North American version of the Indian mango tree or two. It's also known that they have been able to grow corn stalks and we finally pick the ears of corn off from seed to ear in less than 30 minutes. How they do it, we do not know. You can learn the all and asking people, have they seen it? And the quiet, comparatively uninformed, non-scientific, have seen it. And those who have come hundreds and thousands of miles to study it with the most careful methods of recording and instrumentation never see it at all. I've seen some of these things, such as the floating feather, and some of these tricks which these Indians do. Some say it's hypnosis, who knows? But the same situation pertains in Asia. We're not sure. We've heard about the bear and the lake trick for centuries. Every so often, someone sees it. Always, however, for some reason, the recording of it is extremely difficult. In most cases, it's simply the wrong people seeing it. There are people who have not the necessary academic background to be accepted. Or as one man who had an academic background once told me, those who possess such backgrounds can't be avoid seeing it, because it would have no reputation from their own. It's much better and more simple to assume that these mysterious things belong to folklore and peasant minds. So you can travel in India and you will meet some very interesting and remarkable people. You will meet many mystics, some of them world famous. You will meet great artists and great scholars and philosophers like the members of the Tabera family. You will find poets and idealists like Sri Aurobindo. You will find also many important names there which are not known in the West. And around many of these individuals, long traditional beliefs have been built until they have come to be included among the wonder workers and the happiness of Asia. You make a long and difficult pilgrimage to one of these people, and you find a pleasant, kindly, gentle person who gives you the impression of being very wise, but he has no intentions of being coerced. He is not going to tell you what he knows. 
And by the time you get there, after a difficult journey and seen and thrown among his disciples like a patriarch of old, you do not feel that you are quite qualified to ask him leading questions if he does not seem to want to answer them. So you hear what a reputation he has, what wonders he has performed, and then you have to either believe it or not believe it. From one or two of his disciples, you may hear some wonderful accounts. You again have to believe them or not believe them. You are not, in most cases, going to be able to prove these things for yourself. And it makes very little difference whether you are willing to sit quietly in Calcutta or Benari and watch saints that they move by, or whether you try to break across the Tibetan border or get into Sikkim or into Bhutan or perhaps into the great Chinese Turkestan race where reported wonder workers are, you will apparently never really catch up to them. You will get to one of these old monasteries or lamasaries, you will find most wise people, unbelievably wise, so you realize the situation in which they are placed, completely isolated from the outside world. Until a few years ago, they never even saw a newspaper, they never read any book except the ancient religious volumes in their libraries. They saw maybe two or three outsiders in a lifetime. Yet wise they were, learned and kind, deeply versed in their own lore with the faces of sages and saints, strange and suitable faces. And your guide or translator will tell you that this man is a great yogi. Humility. But as far as putting on a demonstration for you, you can just figure that it will not happen. So then we actually went against approximately the same situation when she was there nearly a hundred years ago. And things have not changed a great deal. Civilization has pushed these mysteries further into the background. Science, however, Following in behind civilization has more or less resolved to solve some of these mysteries, if it possibly can. Therefore, there have been research projects undertaken to attempt to demonstrate by scientific means the effects of these so called esoteric exercises upon the body, the mind, the emotions, the heart action, the respiration, all of these things. And these researchers have been, for the most part, positive. They have indicated that these do have effects. But uh, in an effort to classify or organize the findings, there is not yet enough evidence. Mind of Asti also points out the primary difference between two major branches of yoga. Uh, that type of yoga, which primarily has as its purpose some physical, tangible, or material effect. And under this type of exercise, she strongly points out Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga may be, in some instances, what you might term a system of physical culture. Hatha Yoga, having a, it, uh, one of its purposes at least, the improvement of the health of the physical body, the increase of stamina, uh, the uh, correction of certain minor faults of health, the improvement of health, also to a measure the changing of the bodily rhythms for the attainment of a certain measure of intuition or extrasensory perception. An improvement of the body leading to a strengthening of the mental faculties, the intensifying of perceptive and receptive faculties, almost entirely based upon a science of breath or breath control and direction. The SPD points out that Hatha Yoga 
broadly and generally considered is not desirable. To explain why it is not desirable. And uh, my feeling personally is that she is entirely correct in her position. In the first place, any one of these processes involves certain esoteric principles, whether they are very highly involved or not. They represent also specialized techniques for the accomplishment of that or those ends which should be accomplished by natural and normal means without recourse to any special advanced techniques of any kind. In other words, Hyper Yoga is very largely in science or an art for frustrating karma. The individual does what he pleases and then he exercises certain meditative processes and rises above his own mistakes by lifting himself by his own bootstraps. And uh, this is esoteric with bad ethics. If the individual uh, needs certain things, he can always achieve them by perfectly natural means. He does not need to attempt the process of speeding up his vibration, so to say, by throwing a heavy charge of high-frequency electricity to his body. He wants to become more refined, more sensitive than his function. His best and natural way to achieve this is to live better. If he wishes to know more, he can learn more. If he is in need of calisthenics, he can train calisthenics. There are excellent studies in health. There is no need to go to India for these problems or to mix them up with religion when what you're really looking for is banana patty. If you need him, his works are available, a little out of date, but they're still available. If you need to exercise the body, there's always the gymnasium and the cross-country run. If you like it a little easier, there's the dog or the tennis. And if you uh, like to get a great deal of exercise without moving much, there's table tennis. You do not have to resort to any religious procedure to increase the natural efficiencies of the body. Eat wisely, live normally, have proper exercise, rest and relaxation, and a job that interests you, and the body will generally behave itself. But many persons are not satisfied with this. And Hunter Rover comes in as a kind of competitive thing in which the person who knows it feels that he has a sharp edge on the individual who does not know it. And that by three deep breaths he is going to get the contract. <laughs> well, in India, such things are believed to be possible. By three deep breaths, you might get the contract. But um, the real Hindu philosopher feels that this is very close to psychic malpractice. He feels that at best it is very magic, and at worst, black magic. Actually, in as much as it is the involvement of super physical means to attain physical ends. It is another version of the idea of the Philistines binding Samson and then tying him uh, to the millstone to grind their corn. This power of man is not intended to grind corn. A man who needs to have his corn grind should take on the job in a normal, reasonable way. The meaning of that is not at all partial to this idea of the use of any form of esoteric power as a means of evading or neutralizing any physical problem, as a method uh, for the intensification of faculties of powers for competitive purposes. In other words, the motive is not right. 
And because the motive is essentially selfish, trouble is almost inevitably going to result. The individual is going to gradually become what the Easterns call a dead pot, a sorcerer. And a great deal of sorcery goes on in our world, condemning and applauded. The sorcery is almost any form of unfair advantage in which an individual uses religion or esoteric processes in an effort uh, to advance ends which his merits will not permit him to attain. So the HPB is strong for the idea of earning what you want and not becoming mixed up in metaphysics in any way as a means of avoiding the need for personal growth through effort, the reformation of your own temperament through conscientious dedication to self-improvement, and the increase of your spirituality by proper acts of creative integrity. Now she points out definitely that a great deal of this mysterious misuse of psychic uh, power uh, belongs to the tantric field of thought. But she is also willing to admit and if the term tantric, as now used, is a very loose one. If you went to India tomorrow to try to find yourself a really good teacher of yoga, half a yoga or larger yoga, you are not going to have an easy time. It would be just about the same problem as trying to find a great mystic in the Western world. Uh, you have to discount pretension. You can't assume that the individual is genuine because he admits that he is. You can't assume that he knows because he has a mysterious attitude or that he has some kind of a strange private wire with the infinite because he has a turban. These are not guarantees. You will find a great deal of pretension they only saved up for the non-Asiatic. They also saved up by the Asiatics for use with their own. A great many people uh, have been more or less deceived by these things. But we come into another very interesting problem. Many people take it for granted that if they get a bad teacher who is really a charlatan or a shyster underneath, that has developed a splendid manner of handling the situation, so that he simply eases spirituality. <laughs> but if this happens to you, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. But as we've all learned from long and careful experience, this is not true. You're not going to get in trouble unless your own motives are wrong. You can study with a shyster and gain genuine illumination. And never find out till the day you die that he wasn't sincere. Why? Because you were utterly sincere. Your own sincerity is the most powerful perception that you have. You can transcend him. You can accomplish things he only claims to have accomplished. Simply because you made a mistake. So the problem, the, the real difficulty, always arises from a selfish person getting mixed up with a selfish teacher. The combination is fatal. <laughs> if the teacher modestly whispers in your ear that he will make a Mahatma out of you in six months, and you believe him, you are much more to blame than he is. And if you are disappointed, it comes under the heading of cash karma. You have a turn to him. <laughs> And if you have any motive inside yourself other than a genuine desire to be truly good for the sake of goodness and not for the sake of profit, if you have any other motive than this, you can misunderstand the best teaching on earth. And you can get yourself into trouble 
actually the dangerous trouble through the mere recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Everything is removed. H.P.B. points out that Tantra, which is very largely associated primarily with the yoga, has to be divided into two major levels. A tantra that has slowly crept into the world, a tantra that has been variously revealed and exposed and communicated to many Orientals, until now it has a fair following in many, many countries, and a good many books have been written about it. Some of these books would probably be as good as the truth seeker is ever going to find. And still, they are not actually authentic. This tantra that comes out into the world as one of the forms of yoga is built upon a very strange psychological situation. It is built upon the factor or the circumstance that the human being, through the involvement of his mental and emotional structure, can fabricate almost any type of esoteric discipline that exists. He can go through a mass of experiences. He can practice these various disciplines for a lifetime and get himself into the most extraordinary and tragic situation. And as far as yoga or tantra are concerned, he has never even started. He has never gotten off the ground. What he has called tantra is a mental or emotional structure which he has created in his own subconscious. More people have suffered from Kundalini trouble than you will ever find. And scarcely one of them has ever had any actual activity of the Kundalini. The whole thing is what may be termed a psychic creation within himself. He has created an imaginary Kundalini. He has supported it and strengthened it with fantastic systems of misunderstanding. He has memorized at great length things that were never true, therefore has become an expert in them. He has tried these meditation exercises. He has felt every kind of a force moving up and down his spine that you can imagine. He has had all kinds of strange experiences. He has seen lights and sparks and shines all around him. He has felt the top of his head come off. He has finally gotten himself into such terrible situation that he has been hospitalized, finally reaching a point of abject terror where he thinks his condition is incurable or that he has short-circuited his entire psychic organism. And the Kundalini has rested quietly, sound asleep where it always was. And has never been any part of it. But tell the person this, and he will look for a more advanced yogi immediately. He can't believe it. This is one of the situations, of course, that comes into your northern school of Buddhism. This is the reason why the Buddhist school is so adamant in insisting upon the conquest of the mental nature. As the Buddha says, the mind is the slayer of the world. And the most so-called tantra that we know today is simply a mental process. It is a process of self-hallucination in which the individual has, has, has conjured up within himself all the symbols, diagrams, and mysteries that he's ever heard of. And having gotten himself some kind of a brand instructor in the subject, he's also wandering around, trying to prove conclusively that he has something he does not have. And the disciple follows the instruction of the person who has never been there. 
confusion is inevitable. Yet the devotion to these things are very sincere sometimes. But not always the trouble arises from ulterior motive. Why did the individual get mixed up in it in the first place? Was he absolutely and dedicatedly searching only for truth? Was he perfectly willing to give up everything of a personal nature? Was he really anxious to become the homeless wanderer? Or was he, in some way or other, trying to get spiritual in order to gain some ulterior advantage? Now, the advantage may seem very slight, but if it's there, trouble is born. So in actual fact, you have this pseudo-tantra, a great area of almost psychological phenomenon that has passed for tantra, both in this country and in Asia, and wherever it has been taught. A system which has become so deceptive that perfectly sincere people have tried to teach it to each other. And the master may be no better off than his disciple. The whole thing has been moved into a psychological level, part of what Buddha termed this great area of illusion, this great world in which things are not so nor unso, but thinking makes them seem to be. And the individual, therefore, finds in all these yogas and aesthetic processes a tremendous hazard in the form of his own mental attitudes toward these things. Attitudes that may be basically so subjective and so subconscious that he can't accept them only as attitudes, especially if they are backed by books, by recognized writers, and the individual, having followed these instructions, begins to have strange occurrences within himself. It doesn't occur to him that these strange occurrences can be as psychological as the method he is using. But just as surely as the individual under alcohol has a new habit of seeing things that are not there, and being frightened to death by spectres that exist only in his own subconscious, so out of our own mental and emotional processes, we can create and validate anything we want. We can tear it down and invalidate it. We can gain support for any belief, no matter how unreasonable. And we can reject any other belief, no matter how obviously true it may be. It's all part of this maya of the mind this mysterious ocean of illusion in which the individual can drown himself. This is Kunsur's magic garden in Parsifal. This is the mysterious astral light of Oedipus Levy. This magnificent garden of beautiful flowers with a deadly serpent twisted around the stem of each one of them. H.P.B. is pretty strong in her statements on these subjects. Uh, she wanted to warn very definitely and clearly the members of her own esoteric section. She wanted to point out the danger of suddenly falling into patterns that seem wonderful simply because we do not understand them, and seem very valuable because they have been hidden, and which have tremendous meaning for us because of a curious and utterly unreasonable circumstance, that out of millions of human beings, we have been specially selected to receive the instruction. I've had many people come to me, they say, I've just been elected to the inner group of this and that. I don't know why I really don't deserve it. <laughs> well, they don't. <laughs> An individual who doesn't know why who is taking up esoteric studies certainly doesn't deserve to. And the first time he has a vision, he comes to somebody else to interpret it for him. He doesn't even know what he's seeing. 
But he's on his way to Nirvana and nothing can stop it. But instead of landing there, he gradually destroys health. And H. P. D. points out that this can prove to have a tremendous psychological destructive power. Not because it's real. The individual cannot destroy himself. But if he believes he can destroy himself, he can go through all the misery of it. And in the mental structure of his own imagination, he can actually see himself fall apart. Like the individual who told me once that as a result of some trouble psychologically that he had gotten into, he actually experienced himself disintegrate and cease to be. And if he ceased to be, how could he be an observer of it? <laughs> and if he had ceased to be, how could he come back to tell me about it? The whole thing was psychological, but deadly, in terms of what it does to our inner lives. So there is this outer circumference, this outer garden of dreams, this mysterious land of fantasy. And somewhere beyond this fantasy lies the kernel and the fact and the substance of the matter. But to find it, we have to get past the fantasy. And it is to get past this, at least symbolically, that the great initiation systems of the past were invented, in which the candidate faced all kinds of hazards and strange monsters and horrible visions in his search for reality and had to remain strong and untouched in this uh, transcending of all selfishness, fear, and ulterior motive, as H.P.B. explains in her notes on the voice of the silence. Somewhere there is the hard core of Tantra also. There is something there that does work. There is a Tantric philosophy. But the question arises as to whether it's worth the cost. And as far as half yoga is concerned, HPB does not believe that it is worth the cost. And she does not believe that the cultivation of it is the solution to the esoteric problems of mankind. And this way we pass the larger yoga, or the princely way of union. Larger yoga was taught in most ancient times as part of a basic esoteric system of Indian philosophy. It was a series of human regeneration. And as a science, we may assume, and I think HPB assumes, that it is ever a scientific. And many Indian scholars today are attempting to combine Raja Yoga with modern scientific techniques are convinced that it is a science. And for the present, we are perfectly willing to allow it to be. The great speaker of Oxford did not live in quite the type of scientific generation we are in now. She lived in the time, in the dawn of what we would call modern science, the second half of the 19th century. At that time, the great scientific dicta were being established, and the great names of science were being recognized. But most of these names and most of this recognition is long ago in terms of today. And uh, although these men may have only been dead for 50 or 60 years, their findings have long been transcended immeasurably with the rapid growth of scientific knowledge. We may say, therefore, that we are also approaching a scientific state, uh, that we may have in medicine a tremendous scientific skill. We have in psychology a very advanced scientific technique. We have in atomic fusion an almost perfect mathematical science. But with all the science, what do we have? We have a lot of trouble, mostly. And we discover even in material science that science is forever a temptation to pervert power. We know this. We know that the scientist today believes 
that the nation which advances most rapidly in science will rule the world. But of course, by that time, the scientific advancement itself may have transformed the world into a graveyard. But at the same time, whatever is left, science will have it. If only scientists survive. So if you can say also that Raja Yoga is a science, you are only saying only that it is an accurate process which set in motion will always fulfill expectancy. That there, can, that there can be an absolute method by means of which the vibratory rates of the human body can be changed and amplified. And also by means of which the individual can extend power, psychic power, extend vision, inner vision, and can, theoretically at least, become what the old Hindus believed him to be, a cosmic prince in the hierarchy of the great emperor of the world. That this is the true aristocracy, the great aristocracy, and that those who possess it are demigods. India has always believed that there is this art of becoming a demigod. That there was a way in which the individual could transcend his human limitations, becoming more than human, to take his place in the great orders of the Rishi and the Mahatma, to become what the Buddhists call a great Arha or a Bodhisattva. Assume then that this is true. We then have two essential problems in Raja Yoga also. We have to realize that Raja Yoga, White Hatha Yoga, is a victim of the mind of the individual who tries to use it. Raja Yoga also is both an illusionary and a real science. Someday we may wake up and find that science as we know it today is an illusion. But it is an illusion that is so strongly sustained by mental process that nothing can outlaw it except the basic change in the mental procedure of the human being. But if our minds suddenly change, the mind basically substantially change, what would happen to our knowledge? This is a very great question. This is causing the question to arise also as to what people on other planets might be thinking. Maybe they have a form of knowledge that's just as valid as ours and completely opposed to it. We don't know. But we do know that it is perfectly possible for man to create an intellectual existence, create a world in which he rules by his own thoughts about that world imposing his own conclusions upon every phenomenon in life, and finding in his own mind an explanation for everything that happens. But there is no absolute proof that the explanation is correct. He assumes it is. And because most of his own kind either will agree with him, or will depend upon authority, and have no, none of the requirements necessary to break successfully with the traditional pattern, there is no one to repeat him. So he goes on his way, perpetuating his own thinking. Now we can't say that, it, that this thinking is a really. We can say how it might be. And the same is true in the problem of Raja Yoga. There is certainly a psychological form of it. A psychological form of it which is very close to the ideas of cosmonic magic, charms, amulets, and things of this nature. A primitive person holds in his hand three small sticks. These are sticks that are built off of a little branch. These sticks he is perfectly aware, have no special influence, no special meaning, 
And the means that he could hope from that from them would be that they would keep his campfire burning for another ten seconds. That's about all. He knew there was nothing remarkable about these things. They can't save him. They can't give him enlightenment. They can't make his family happy or his life fruitful. The three steps. And that's all. But down through the wisdom of these people, there was a belief. Well, if you take three steps and you put them together in a certain arrangement and you tie them with a piece of wool of a certain color, immediately you don't have three steps of yours. Now you have great magic. Now you have something that can make sure that your wife will have only sons and that they will all be strong. You have something that makes certain that your enemy cannot overcome you, and that both cannot afflict you in sleep. If you set these fixed tied in this way, lay upon the place of hope where you need the pain. You believe this. Something, however, has to happen to the three steps first. The three steps won't do it. You have to bring into the three step pattern magic. You have to bring in a tremendous believing. You have to bring in all the strange background that has given us the zombie and the evil eye. And of course, if you watch the television programs regularly, you can become very proficient in this in no time. You can believe anything. And lots of people do. But the combination of the sticks, the magic spell, the fact that it was blessed by the priest, the fact that it was made according to the ancient formula, all of these things transform the common place into the wonderful. No individual looking inside of himself, saying to himself, I don't amount to too much in there. I can, I can work really very, very hard, and I don't think I ever amount to anything in particular. I don't see any great abilities in here. I, I don't sense any great spiritual destiny inside myself. And I'm, I just go along from day to day, and that's the way it is. But he gets the book, and he learns all about these mysterious chakras along the spine. He sees in the diagram something he never suspected before, namely that he has a kind of trellis on his spine from which these blossoms hang. Also that by certain exercises, by holding these things in his mind, by trying to sit in the full lotus posture, which life is not London paralysis, he will be able to cause a mysterious energy to move through these mysterious flowers. And as a result of several years of conscientious practice, he will become a superman. Now, all of these elements are like tiny sticks together. He gradually unfolds within his own nature a firm belief in these things. Very soon he will be able to practically see these centers. If he goes to sleep and dream a little, he will dream of them. Gradually it will reach a point in which he actually would have to fight with him in order to try to prove to him that he wasn't seeing them. He yeah, he hasn't seen them. But he knows they're there. Why does he know they're there? Because his favorite author says so. He just chased around and around and around in circles. And how to create these mysterious forces, that's very secret. That has to be communicated by someone who really knows, and there always somebody, there always somebody around for this occasion. So after a little while, the person uh, begins to have strange feelings. He wouldn't under such conditions. Another amazing thing is that he had the strange feelings before. But when he had the strange feelings before, they were just strange feelings. So he took an aspirin and forgot about it. Now he had them, an excited malpractice. Somebody somewhere is trying to prevent him from becoming a Mahatma. <laughs> that magic. 
Why does he know it's black magic? Because we've been practicing it to try on someone else. No one suspects that other people could try it on him. This is devastating. In a little while, this first person frightens himself to death. And he goes on, and he uh, follows along some such belief as this, and after a while, he gets into a little difficulty with his favorite guru, whoever this may be. And the guru, being a great heart of a noble soul, tells this man that if he ever leaves him, he'll hold him to death, which is a very kind of thing to do. <laughs> that if he leaves, his soul is lost. That he is tied just as Faust was tied to him to Mephisto for the rest of his life. Look the man believe it. So from that time on, he proceeds to haunt himself. He proceeds to develop one fear after another until he completely demoralizes his mental and emotional life and can become violently insane. Why? Not because he misused these chakras. Not because the serpent power got away and bit him, but simply because he never had it in the first place. It was all one level of thinking fighting another. The man frightening itself to death, which it does frequently. And the man building up one fear after another and so the person is terror stricken by his own thoughts. These thoughts turning back upon the nervous system producing a variety of symptoms. Symptoms that go with almost every type of conceivable hysteria is what it amounts to. The individual is frightened, he's out of his bed, he thinks he's destroyed himself. The hysteria does the rest. This hysteria can bring deafness, it can bring blindness. It can cause him to have every type of sensation, misery, pain, headache, backache, and everything else. And it's all in his own mind. This, of course, brings the next question up very quickly. Supposing the individual escapes all of these confusing, complicated circumstances and does attain to some degree of skill. Supposing all in his own mind, because that's all he's working with at the moment, the all of our mind, he has visualized this system. He has visualized himself practicing with exactly the set forth by Sir Arthur Avalon. 